for coming. And I know Jim today is going to talk about giving everything to God. So I pray right now that we can let go of our distractions, that we can let go of anything that we brought into church that we really shouldn't in our minds, and we can just let that go and realize that God has overcome and we can do everything through him. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our a minute and greet those around you.
Good morning, church. Good morning, George. I'm running a little bit behind there today. Man, it's great to see everybody out this morning. Uh, man, it was foggy early this morning. I've not been out for a while. I'll see what it looks like now. But great day to be in the house of the Lord, regardless of what the weather is outside. If you're a first-time visitor with us today, we are especially glad that you're here. So if you are a first-time visitor and you haven't already done so, there should be a bag for you, a goodie bag in the lobby. There'll be a smiling face there in your exit today to give one of those to you. So take a moment and get one of those for yourself if you're a first-time visitor. If you've been with us before and didn't get one before, by all means, uh, stop there and do that this time if you would. Uh, also, if you're visiting with us or regular attendee, it doesn't really matter. Within your uh, bulletin, there's a tear-out section that has a prayer request card. So if you want to use that section to share information about your family, you'll sure do that. You can drop that in the offer plate towards the end of the service or give it to Jim or myself when you leave the service today. So you can use that to share information about yourself and your family if you're a visitor or a prayer request card uh, if you want to share any prayer request with Jim or the church family. So keep that in mind too. It's well open to everyone. So take advantage of that. It is a good way to share some information with everyone. Uh, so again, welcome. As far as announcements this morning, we have a couple I'm going to make. One is I'm going to let Joey, uh, well, let me do the first one of them first and you can do it after me, Joey. Uh, first, you know, this week, it's hard to believe county school, Mass County School starts back this week, Wednesday. And I know some of you are really excited about that. And some of you are not so excited about that. So, but regardless if we're excited or not about going back to school, we're having a back to school bash on Wednesday night. So I hear there's going to be a water slide here, and the weather's going to be beautiful. It's going to be a great day for a water slide. That's Wednesday night, 6 to 8. You don't have to be in school to come, so by all means, come by. It's going to be a great time of fun. And again, that's our back to school bash on Wednesday night, 6 to 8 o'clock. So just come by and enjoy that time. And now I'm going to give it to Joey to make an announcement about our uh, youth program. Well, good morning again. Um, just uh, we thought it would be a good idea to kind of let you guys know um, what's going on in the youth program. We're making some changes, uh, some exciting things happening with our youth. Um, on Sunday mornings, from now on, our, uh, well, starting in two weeks, September 2nd, uh, our high school and middle school youth are going to be meeting uh, downstairs um, in the youth area. We've, we've been working on it for about two, three weeks now, kind of changing some stuff up, uh, trying to make it fun, new, exciting. Uh, but our youth is now uh, high school, middle school, going to meet downstairs. Um, we're going to have their own uh, Sunday morning service uh, tailored for them. Uh, we want the youth to feel, um, I don't want to use the word special, but uh, we want them to feel like uh, we're giving them um, just something tailored exactly for them, um, a place where they can feel comfortable, open, and welcome. Um, so that's starting in two weeks, just giving you guys a heads up about stuff that's happening. It's not going to be every single week. Um, on Youth Sundays, uh, everybody's going to come back up here, um, so it's not like we're hiding your kids away in the basement forever. Um, and then, obviously, if they're more comfortable, and uh, visitors especially, uh, if you want to stay up here, that's totally fine. But I just wanted to let everybody know that it's uh, an option, and it's going to be available coming up in two weeks, September 2nd. So fun, new, exciting things in the youth ministry. Awesome. That's all I got, George. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Well, that is a pretty big change for us, so I thought I'd let Joey uh, make that announcement. Uh, this morning, Jim's going to be continuing his series on the Take God at His Word. And last week, Jim opened up that series, but the actual title of the message was Take God at His Word. And I got a couple of Jim are going to come forward and help me. Uh, we, last week, we would like every family to have this book, this book, Take God at His Word. So if you didn't get one last Sunday, please take the opportunity to get one today. These Jim are going to hand those out. So if you don't have one, need one, hold your hand up and they'll give you one. Okay? So Jim's message this morning is going to be on chapter one of the book. You don't have to read, hadn't read the, if you haven't read the chapter, you're not behind. He'll catch you up today, so that's not going to be a problem. But we are going to use this book for the sermon series of the next few weeks. So it is important you get one. And Jim's definitely going to talk about that more during the service this morning, during his message. 
Also today, uh, I have a gentleman, a couple of gentlemen going to help me with something else. Within your bulletin, there was a handout or an insert, and I have it here somewhere. I thought I did. Maybe I don't. Yeah, here it is. It looks like this. It's important that everyone has one of these, not just one per family, but everyone has one this morning. This is not necessarily homework, but it's kind of a participative service this morning. Jim is going to ask you to use this form. It's not meant to be a family form. It's meant to be a single individual form. So if you haven't got one, Anthony, come up to the front here and see if anybody doesn't have one. Uh, Kenny or whoever, Corey, come up and make, come to the front here and make sure you see everybody. If, if you don't have one of these, raise your hand. Corey, come to the front here so you can see. If you don't have one of these, just make a motion and one of these guys will give you one. Okay? So it's important you have that. See anybody that doesn't have one? Raise their hand. I see a couple back there. All right. So we're going to take a moment to do that so we don't interrupt Jim's service message later on. So we're going to do that right now. So the gentleman is going to take just a moment to do that. As I mentioned, Jim's message this morning is uh, going to be based on chapter 1. And that's, uh, he can make you rich in every way. So Jim's going to be talking this morning about lots of things, uh, what we define as riches, what we define as uh, you know, goodness and greatness. Uh, so I'm sure you're going to be, make sure you stay awake, but you're going to be interested in Jim's message this morning. It's a powerful message. And then towards the end of the service, he's going to ask everyone to kind of participate in that individually. So uh, I look forward to that. Uh, one of the main scriptures he's going to use this morning is from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 7 through 11. And a while ago, I wasn't checking my email on my phone. I was just trying to find that scripture. And uh, so let me read that for you. Again, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11. And I'm reading from the New American Standard. Each one must do just as he had purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberty, which brought us, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Keep those verses in mind this morning as our praise team leads us in a couple of praise and worship songs. As we do prepare our hearts and our mind for Jim's message this morning. Please stand.
pray for just a minute. God, we praise you and we thank you. Um, we thank you that we can come here, God, that um, we don't have to fear um, repercussions for coming to worship you freely, God. And I pray that we can continue to do that. And as we talked about, God, help us to get rid of any distractions. Help us just to focus on you, Lord. We thank you and we love you. You are an incredible God and you take care of us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Morning, church. Good to see everybody. How many of y'all read the book along with us? Read the first chapter. Okay, okay. The, the title of the sermon this morning is "He Will Make You Rich in Every Way," and we're taking God at His word. 
And for us to make the kind of a statement that says he'll make you rich in every way, the tendency is to think, well, what about this way or that way where, I don't, where I'm not rich? I want to challenge you this morning to, to take a look at what rich really is and, and what it means to us. And before we get started, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact, Father, that we can take you at your word. And as we go through this series of sermons, I pray, Lord, that, that we begin to actually not just talk about it, but begin to actually believe it and move on it to do the things that, that you have told us that we should be doing, to realize the rewards of what we do, to see, Father, that if we will obey, you will bless. And, Lord, help us to, to see that, especially as we, we look this morning at some tough things in our lives that, that we, we may be a little off on. Help us, Father, to, to see what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you believe that God rewards? What do you think? Yeah? There's some scripture here I want to share with you. And, and, and as, we go into, as we go into taking God at his word and believing what he says, I want, you to, I want you to keep these scriptures in the back of your mind as we go through the message this morning. First of all, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If we seek God first, he will add to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8 says, Each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So the Lord here says that he will reward us according to what we do. Right? Hebrews eleven six. 6, God rewards those who seek him. He tells us in Scripture, if we search for him with all of our heart, we'll find him. If we search for him with all our heart, maybe we haven't found him in the way that we should, and we don't see him the way we should. Then lastly, Revelation 22, 12. I want you to hold on to this one. Christ himself says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. To render to every man according to what he has done. That speaks to us in a couple different ways. The reward that we have for obedience will be a reward that is great that he'll give us. The reward for disobedience will also be dished out and handed to us all as well. Do you think about that? Do you think about the rewards that we will receive are in accordance to what we do and how we obey? That's where I want to go this morning. That's what I want us to see. In the book... Take God at his word. On page 10 in the book, it, it, it said that giving to the Lord is a God-backed, guaranteed investment, not an uncertain gamble. If we will give to the Lord, we have a guaranteed return. Do you believe that? You see, the thing I want us to see, and, and one of the passages of Scripture that's used a lot, especially that deals with, with giving money, and yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. We're going to talk about money, but we're also going to talk about other areas of service and worship. But if you go to Malachi chapter 3, I'd like for you to, to pick it up here as we look at, at verse 7 down through verse 10. It says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Do you believe that? That we have been robbing God with money? 
with the tithes and the offerings that are due him? Do, do you see that as robbery? You see, something that is really important here, he says, if you will give the whole tithe, I will open the windows of heaven, and I'll give you so much you won't believe how good I can be to you. Do we, do we really believe that that's the case? If I, if I put money in the offering plate, he's going to give me more money? Is that what he's saying here? Is he going to, is he going to bless me financially? As we go on and through some of this, I want you to see what Scripture is being, what Scripture is saying here. As we as we begin to look at this, and we we have a tendency to think when we think of giving to the Lord, we we seem to naturally go to our wallets and our pocketbooks, and we think of the church wants our money. God doesn't need your money. He needs your worship. He needs your obedience. He needs your heart. This is a way you can show him love and obedience by what you do have, realizing that your, what you have isn't yours, it's his. See, that another, another passage in the book says that the thing that we need to realize is the source of our provision and our blessings. Where is the source of your money? In your bank account? In your checkbook? Your paycheck? Is that the source of your income? No. That's the means of your income. The source of your income is the Lord. He's a source of your income. He's a source of your job. He's a source of your health. He's a source of your service. He's a source of everything that you have. I read this week something that I want you to consider. The, we tend to think of the source as being something that we have done that we can go to. It's not. Even the source of our very lives as you take a breath, as you take your next breath, someone is taking their last. Think about that. That's a blessing that you're given. God is giving you each and every breath. And for some people, their breath is, oh, is done. Their life is over. As long as we have breath, we're to serve and to worship the Lord. He's the source of everything. Your job your bank account, your health, all that you have, that can be taken away. Your material goods, that can be taken away today. The source is the Lord. And the sooner we begin to see that and live that and believe that, the sooner, the sooner we're going to be better off in our lives and our relationship with Him. Matthew 17, 20 says, If we have faith like a mustard seed, Mountains will move. Nothing will be impossible for us. Do you believe that? If we will exercise our faith as it deals with our tithing and our giving to the Lord, do we have enough faith to take God at His word and give what He says to give? Back in Malachi, He says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. A tithe is 10% of your income. Old Testament, New Testament, it's in the Bible. We still owe God our tithe. That's not ours to deal with. That's not ours to negotiate over with Him. That's His. He asks for it. He commands that we give it to Him. The whole tithe, not part of the tithe, not some of the tithe, and not some of the ways we have twisted the tithe. He said, that is mine give it to me. He's entitled to that. He, he deserves that. And we rob him by not doing it. And I don't know how to make it any plainer. I don't know how to make it any simpler. The Lord commands it. We say we will take God at his word. When he says bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, you bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Done. And I'm not saying this because the church wants your money. As I said earlier, God doesn't need your money. He, de he demands your obedience. And He will not settle for anything less. And if we do less, then we're serving another God. And He plainly states again, there are no other God before me. He is our God. He has created 
us with the abilities and blessed us with the money that we have and he is demanding his share of it we're not to question it we're to obey it now we'll go deeper into it tonight if you'll come back at six o'clock we'll talk more about what's a tithe what's an offering what's a gift what's what's required he also goes on and, and says and if you go with me to second corinthians chapter nine I want to read this as, as well, and maybe it'll change our, our perspective on what we're, what we're thinking of as far as giving to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Now, in my Bible, I have a New American Standard. And when you go to verse 7 and you begin to read those words, it says, each one must do. In my translation, must do is italicized for emphasis. Which means if you go back and look at this, he is not saying each one should do, ought to do, thinks about, considers, no, must do. You must do what the Lord has put in your heart. Not under grudgingly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. Best illustration I can think of, when the offering plate comes by, you ought to smile. And you ought to dig deep in your pocket and give him the 10% that he's entitled to with joy in your heart. Not grudgingly, not out of obligation, out of worship and love and joy and respect and admiration and praise for the Lord in thankfulness, which is hard for us to conceive to be thankful that we're giving our money to the Lord. But if we stop and think, what has he given to you? We should want to have the opportunity to worship with our tithes and our offerings. But if you will, go back to verse 9 here. I'm sorry, verse 8. <clears throat> and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. We're rich. He will give us everything we need to give generously. The definition of rich in the book here that, the, that is in Scripture as well, it's not in what we obtain and what we possess. Rich is the ability to be generous in giving. You see the difference? Being rich is not all that I have. I'm not rich because of my possessions. I'm rich because of my generosity in giving. So maybe what we think of as far as wealth and goods and blessings is not what we have, but actually in what we give. And if we will give generously, God will provide so that we will always be able to give generously, even to the point to where we'll be amazed at how much we can give. Now, how does that sit with you? Do you consider yourself rich because you have the opportunity to give? Or do you hold on to what you have to obtain so you can become rich? You see the difference in perspective? You see, taking God at his word changes the definition of what we consider rich to be for most of us. You see, when we, when we see ourselves as rich, from that perspective, we see the opportunity to worship God with our riches. And to give generously. Now that could be money, but that can also be in talent, in ability, in service, in worship, all of those other things. Are we giving less than what God has given us?
to give? When he asked for 10%, do we want to negotiate with that? What is he really entitled to? What does he really deserve? He really should get more. But we tend to think of God giving us blessings, and many times we will even go as far as to the point of saying, Lord, I'll be glad to give, but you have to give me first. Think about that. You ever said that? I'd love to be able to give more. And, and, and once I pay off the car, or once I pay off my mortgage, or, or once this happens, or once that happens, I'll be able to do that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, right now, today, you bring the whole tithe into the warehouse. Then watch how he blesses you. We want to negotiate with God. I'll start giving when you give first. And that's not what he's saying. And we tend to think of all of the things that he does give us as blessings that we're to hold on to and keep and enjoy because he's blessing us. His blessings come with responsibility. His blessings come with commandments to use that to bring praise and honor and worship back to him through helping other people and through doing what he's commanded us to do. Let me give you an idea of how twisted I think we have made this. Bob Russell, some time ago, I heard him say, what do you think the, the, the status of the church, how, how much would the church grow if a law were passed that says, if you are a Christian, you don't have to pay any income tax. We would have the greatest revival of all time. Don't you think? Do you think that people would come and see that as such a blessing that God is giving us that if we will join his church, we don't have to pay income tax? Isn't God good to us? You see that? That makes sense, doesn't it? That sounds good. What if a law were passed that says if you are a Christian, you have to pay double income tax? Now, what will happen to the church? What's rich? God's word here says, if you will test me in this, I will bless you beyond measure. If we, were to, if we were to take God at his word, and if a law were passed that said, if you are a Christian, you must pay double income tax, the Lord would provide for us to pay double income tax. Do you believe that? <laughs> it didn't sound real confident. Do, do, we, do we really take God at his word to the point to where we'll accept the blessings? Thank you, Lord, you are so good to us. But will we accept adversity with the understanding that he will provide for us to get through it? Do we see that as the real blessing? The blessing's not in what we have. The blessing is in who has us and what he wants to do and what he's offered us. And what, what, he will, what he will do for us and with us, through us, so that others can see him in us. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, it says that God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Basically, what this is saying is you can't negotiate with God. You can't fool God. And the thing that we do with our money is we have tried to work a way around to where we don't have to pay what he's saying we have to. When he says 10%, well now does 10%, is that, is that gross or is that net? Does that, does that include Christmas gifts and bonuses and, and all that kind of thing? Does, does that mean that, that if, I, if I get a check that I wasn't expecting, I've got to, I've got to tithe on that also? Or here's what I'm going to do. I tell you what, I'll tithe, but I'm going to write in the, in the side of the check where you make the memos that this is to go to what I want it to go to. That's not what he's saying. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You give 10% to me, to your church, the local church, so that the Lord will use that money for what he wants that purpose to be. Now, if you want to give to something, you give to something. But the tithe is the Lord's. And I know that goes against some of the way y'all think out there. But I love you too much to misdirect you. I want you to know what God's Word says plainly and clearly. And I really believe when you start doing that, 
the windows of heaven will open and you'll begin to see blessings like you've never seen before. Which brings the question up, what do we really need? When God says, I will supply all your needs, what do we need? Food, shelter, clothing, right? Go with me, if you will, to, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. In chapter 10, around verse 20, 21, Jesus is speaking to a man that we know as the, as the, 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 the rich young ruler. And he comes to the Lord. He was rich, obviously, says so. That's how they describe him. He comes to the Lord and he says, Lord, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, what, what does the law say? What are you supposed to do? And he says, oh, I've done all that. I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. I've, I've, I've been obedient to you in, in everything. And if you look at verse 21, I want you to pay attention to what this verse says. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said, this guy who has, in his mind, done everything he needs to do, he's got it all down pat. This man, young man, I believe, was expecting Jesus to say, oh, you're in. You've done everything you're supposed to do. You've got it, you've got it whipped. You're, you have my personal endorsement. You are in heaven. But that's not what he says. And he sees that in this young man. He sees that arrogance. He sees that pride. And it causes him to love him even more. And he says to him, one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. That's not what he wanted to hear. And that's not what we want to hear. The things that we have, we think like the rich young ruler. God has blessed me with money and property and power and a job and all of these things. I'm good to go. He says, no. What you need to see is you're missing the point. What you consider to be blessings, money, property, that's the two descriptions that we have, that he, things that he owned. Those are not what you need to have eternal life with him. He's saying, go sell everything. Take that God that you worship and get rid of it. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's what Scripture says. Don't, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where, where things th th rust and moth-eaten and they're destroyed and thieves come in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven that don't rust and aren't moth-eaten and thieves don't take. That's where we're to lay our treasures up, in heaven. The rich young ruler here was deceived by Satan who thought, all I have to do is do all the, the laws and I can have whatever I want and realize that that's a blessing from God. And he's saying, no, that's not a blessing. It's a curse. You need to get rid of that. So the, the food, shelter, and clothing, let me ask you this, would you rather have that or would you rather have Christ? Salvation. And heaven, what do you need? He tells us in his word, don't worry about what to wear, what to eat, where to live. The ungodly think about those things and, and worry about them. Look at the, field, the flowers of the field. Look at the birds of the air. I take care of them. Won't I take care of you? Don't pursue those things. You don't need that. You need me is what the Lord's saying. In a, in a passage in, in Corinthians we, we read, it says, he will, he will give us grace. He'll forgive us for the way that we have thought before. And He'll forgive us and He'll give us a new life. He'll give us a new opportunity. And He'll give us everything we need to be what, we would, what He would have us to be. And realize that the blessings that we need and that we have have already been given to us. We shouldn't be asking the Lord for, the bless, for us, Him to give us blessings. We should be thanking Him for the blessings that He has given us and use them to turn things around and worship Him and show others the love of Christ because we have been made so rich. Do you see that? 
You see, we tend to, we tend to judge people and categorize people by, by the cars that they drive and the houses that they live in and the lifestyles that they live. That's what the world pursues. Some of the richest people I know live from payday to payday. But some of the happiest people that I know live from payday to payday. And they thank the Lord for the blessings that they have received and the opportunity they have to help other people and give to others. While the majority of us seem to think, well, once I reach this place, then I'll help because I'll have excess and I can have what I want and I can still help. And that's not what the Lord is saying. He says, dismiss that. Sell all that out. And put all of your faith and all of your dependence and all of your hope on me and realize how blessed you are and how rich you are and how well you can serve and do for me. Then you'll find happiness. And it's not just a happiness that lasts for a little while. It's eternal because those treasures that you have, you've, you've placed in heaven. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, Jesus plainly again say, states, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Is your treasure your bank account? Your house, your job, your possessions? Then that's where your heart is. Is your treasure the Lord? The relationship that you have with him, the opportunity that he gives you to help and serve other people, to worship him, then that's where your heart is. Some of us need heart transplant. Some of us need to see how well we are off and how rich we truly are and what we do possess in our relationship with the Lord and realize that that will outlast anything that this world will give us. Do you see that? Here's, here's what I want you to do this morning, if you will. You should have that half sheet of paper that George was talking about. Take a look at, take a look at the top of that again. And the passage in there, it says, Each one must do as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. What's God saying to you right now? What does he want you to give? Is it the whole tithe? Is it service? Is it worship? Is it closer relationship to him? What has God put on your heart to do? See, the thing that we need to realize, and this is, this is vital, he speaks to us and says, give me your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Love your neighbor. And we have the opportunity to do that. And if we will ask him to help us do that, he will give us much, much more than we need to do the job. He will bless us, open the windows of heaven, he says, and give us what we need. We already have the blessing to share. But we have free will. He can say, and I think this probably hit home more than anywhere else. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Give me 10% of your income without any questions asked. We can do that or not. We have free will. We can do it begrudgingly in a complaining way without a cheerful heart. We can do that. Or we can realize what he's given us the opportunity to do and do it with a cheerful heart to the point that we, we begin to look for ways to give more. Not just money. More time. You know, we're talking about a Giving God August kind of a campaign that we that, that originally I thought kind of got washed out, but I, I think really more than ever now, 
we need to work with what we have. Do you, do you realize in your bulletin the opportunities that we have to come into the Lord's house and fellowship and worship and grow? And we don't? Maybe he's saying to you, get more involved. Maybe he's saying, I, I need you to give more of your time so you'll have a closer relationship with me so I can bless you even more. Just come and, and, and come closer to me. Maybe that's what he's saying. Whatever he's saying to you, whatever you have determined to do in your heart, as, as Scripture says here, each one must do as he has purposed in his heart. Right now, as you have that piece of paper in your hand and a pencil, I hope, what are you going to purpose to do for the Lord that maybe you've never done before? And here's what I want you to do with it. Here in just a minute, we're going to sing our invitational hymn. And we're going to do this a little bit differently. As, as we sing the hymn, the song, I want you to look at that piece of paper and I want you to write down what you purpose to do for the Lord. And as we're singing the invitation, I want you to take that piece of paper and bring it up front here and give it to God on this table. You tell him, Lord, this is what I purpose in my heart to do, and I'm bringing it to you so you can have it and see it. And you put that on the table. These are the papers from first service. And then you walk and go do it. What do you think? Ooh, it got real all of a sudden, didn't it? We're not going to just talk about this. The, the, the study that we're doing, the sermon series, is we're going to take God at his word. And when God speaks to our heart, we're going to obey and, and you have the opportunity right now to fully obey him, to hear what he's saying to you and say, yes, Lord, I'm in. I'm with you. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to serve, and I'll do this with a cheerful heart, whatever it is. Or you can say, no. Let me, let me share something with you. First service this morning, I'm going to say we had maybe 40 people. I bet you there's 40 papers on that table. Now, I'm not saying that to try to shame you into what, you're, what you should do. I'm trying to get you to see that there are people in this congregation that actually take God at his word. And they're taking this sermon series seriously. This isn't just a Sunday morning, hour, hour and a half with God, and then walk out of here and go do what I want to do. We're changing lives. And the Lord has called us to change our lives. To actually begin to take him at his word and do what he lays on our heart without question in full obedience. That's the opportunity that you have right now. Does everybody have a piece of paper? If you don't have one, raise your hand. Got one right here. One right here. I don't want you to do this out of obligation. Or begrudgingly, as Scripture says, I want you to see the opportunity that you have. Everybody have an ink pen, pencil, crayon, something to write with, need one? We want to take the time to do this so we can do it right. Now, understand this too. I'm not going to take these back in my office and read them and try to think who you are. <laughs> you know, we're not going to put this in a bulletin and say, you know, well, Jonathan said he's going to do this. Let's see if he does. Now, what, what we're going to do is we're going to, this is between you and the Lord. And if you remember, it says that we will be rewarded in accordance to our actions. So if we tell the Lord we're going to do this, he's going to hold us to it. And he's going to judge us for it. So this isn't something to play with. This is something to be serious about. Okay, I think everybody's got a paper. Everybody's got something to write with. Pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, these are one of those times where we, uh, we come face to face with you. And Lord, we realize the blessings that we already have. And if we will truly open our eyes to your word this morning, we see that we are already rich. We already possess everything we need. And we need, Father, to begin to, to worship you and to, to see the opportunities that you give us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven not treasures on earth, not things that will pass away and be moth-eaten and rust and burn, but things that will last forever. And Lord, this all hinges on our relationship with you. 
Help us, Father, to see the opportunity that you've put in front of us right now. Speaking to our hearts, telling us that this, this is what I want you to do, knowing that we have the opportunity to purpose within our hearts right now what we will do for you. And Lord, I pray that we're bold in what we say. That we, that we write down what you have placed on our hearts knowing that it may well, very well be that we can't do it by our own power or under our own control. We need to depend on you to achieve what you've called us to do. And Lord, this opens up a whole new relationship with you. We begin to see our need and our dependence on you. And you tell us that when we do that, that you will bless us to, an, to a point to where we will be amazed at what we can accomplish through you. Nothing will be impossible for us if we're in accordance to your will. So Lord, help us to commit to irrational, supernatural things so that we can see you in our lives and bless others. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please stand. Let's sing. Bring those forward as we sing. <clears throat>
you all. Please be seated. For those of you that might be visiting with us this morning, this is the part of the service where we, we worship with, our, with communion and our offering. And I want to, in light of what we've been talking about here this morning, I, I want you to consider what a blessing we have to worship in communion and with our tithes and offerings. To put this in kind of a worldly kind of a setting, what would you pay for this? What, what would you pay to have Jesus Christ take your sins upon himself so you can have eternity with him? What's that? What's that? What dollar figure do you put on that? We can't pay that. We, we can't come close to that. And he knows that. And he understood that. And he sent his son to pay that price because we can't. Isn't that a blessing? How often do we go through life when we say, what do you need? We don't even consider what we already have. And he, he says in, in Scripture, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And I wonder if we remember the real price that was paid. So as you, as you take the cup and as you take the bread, think of that price that we can't pay, but because of his love, unconditional, unmerited, unearned love. The love that he had for us, he willingly did that for us. We're rich. We're blessed. To the point that where when we follow communion with the offering, what's your relationship worth? God being who he is, and you being who you are, me being who I am, what's it worth to have that relationship? And we don't want to pay a full tithe. We're inconvenienced by wanting the church wanting me to put money in the offering plate. No, no, no. This is the Lord giving you the opportunity to worship him cheerfully. So think about those things. Pray with me. Father, as we come to this portion of the service, which I believe is key, help us to realize your love for us. So many times we, we have a tendency to put a value on things based on, on money. What's this worth? What's that worth? Lord, we're in a completely different realm here. There's no way we could have what we have without you paying the price. Without you giving us what we didn't deserve. Mercy, grace, forgiveness, a washing away of sins, a promise of eternal life. Lord, as we take the emblems this morning, the cup and the bread, help us to see the price that was paid. And help us, Lord, not to lose focus, but to realize that that is the love that you have for us, and you give us this opportunity to remember you. Then, Lord, as we come to the offering for our tithes and, and, our, and our offerings, Lord, help us to give with a cheerful heart, not because we have to, but because we want to. To realize that, that there, again, there's no dollar value to our relationship with you. But you do tell us to give you our best. So, Lord, help us to settle for nothing less. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
thank you all for being with us this morning. Two things real quick. Uh, first of all, this evening, 6 o'clock, we'll go deeper into what we're talking about this morning. We'd, we'd love to have you come. It's an interactive study where we, we talk and we discuss. We'll have to be set up over here on the, on the side of the church. We'd love, again, we'd love to have you here. Also, um, if you don't have a book, we still have books available. Take God, take God at His Word. These books cost about six bucks a piece, and the church has bought, bought them and want every family to have one. If the Lord lays it on your heart that you would like to help donate to offset the cost of those books, there's a bucket back there. This is not mandatory. We're just saying if you feel that you could, and it would be great, greatly appreciated if you could help. Let's, uh, let's stand and be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Father, for all that you give us. And I pray this morning, Father, that we, as we came in here today, we may think that we don't have a lot but, Lord, I pray that we leave here realizing how blessed we truly are. We also realize, Father, that with those blessings comes responsibility. We're to go out into the world and share your love with others. And, Lord, sometimes that seems difficult for us. But help us to realize, as your word says right now, this morning, as we read, you have given us more than an adequate supply to meet the needs of every good deed. So, Lord, help us to realize that we are fully armed to go and to do your will. Help us, Lord, to take confidence in that and to take you at your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us.